and um, I'd like you to like to introduce you to to Kwesi. So are you ready? I think so. <laughs> Okay. I'd just like to say that the pleasure is all mine, so thank you for making this possible as well, for all the work that you've put into it. So, yeah, let's get started. Okay. <laughs> there, there is no curating without the work of artists, so let me just say that. <laughs> but thank you. Um, so how are you feeling? Not just today. <laughs> um, this, this, this exhibition has been two plus years, I guess, in the making. Um, it was intended to be, be launched and exhibited one year, and then, you know, it didn't quite happen that way. And then here we are two plus years later, um, and this is what, the third week, with another week to go. How are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling mostly humbled by it all. It's been very, very overwhelming, right? And um, I like to think that mostly my work is usually um, I hold on to them and find it often difficult to share. The ways that I know how to share best is usually on social media. Mm -hmm. So having to see them printed up on these walls and on like Carnamula paper, no less, it's, it's really, really overwhelming and very, very humbling. And I'm really, really, like I'm relieved one that it's actually <laughs> happened and I'm in the space sharing it with all of you. So for that, I'm like really, really flawed. Cool. Um, so I talked about the two-year journey to, to the show in this space, um, but there's a journey to get to this place um, before that. So could you talk a bit about your journey from Ghana to Canada? What, what, what brought you here? Okay, so um, we'll go deeper into what actually brought me here and like the process of my work, but uh -huh. essentially um, after uh, my Emmanuel exhibition in 2017, I arrived at a certain point where I needed a new lease on life. So for me, Canada became that haven and a new chapter, if I should put it that way, for me to continue with my creative process. Mm -hmm. And um, it's still unfolding as we can all see. So yeah, for me, that's what it's been. A lot went on back home, still going on actually, but I- What, what kinds of things? Well, personal growth, mm -hmm. that's one and um, finding myself, finding my voice, what it is that I really am, um, my true calling would probably be. Mm -hmm. So all of that, coupled with family, coupled with friends, coupled with work, lots lots of things in that. We'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll delve deeper, and some of them are actually like represented here in the space, so we'll be able to delve into that deeper. But yeah, in that regard, yeah, it's been a journey. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and how many years have you been here in, in Toronto? Um, the, so August will be my fourth year. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned, um, so some of the work in this space has been previously exhibited. Yes, um, actually one. Only one piece? One, yeah. The one that's actually blown up over the umbilicus. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a part of the Emmanuel series. So um, to talk a bit more about Emmanuel, it was um, my um, question or my exploration of the concept of who is God in mortal man? Mm -hmm. And how do we as creators embody that notion, if I should put it that way? So for me, oops, sorry, a lot of it is in how we appear, how we present ourselves and in strength and in um, who we, I guess, who we grow to become as we live on earth. So um, Emmanuel One was um, a muse of mine. I met and um, we, cultivated that friendship that grew and taught me a lot about myself, mm -hmm. about friendship, about brotherhood, about strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses, all of that about masculinity. So for me, it was me just sharing that process with the world in like 10 images that I put together. They were, half of it was black and white, it's kind of like these portraits on um, my right side, but Mike is funny, but yeah. And um, I had color then, so that's an actual stark difference from what you're seeing here and then. Um, there were landscapes in there. One really black and white landscape that really caught attention was um, one I took um, of a nighttime. I was out, I like to travel, then I used to travel a lot, to um, Maxim. It's a little spot in um, the western part of Ghana. Mm -hmm. So one night I couldn't sleep. I had my camera with me and I was just sitting out on the balcony, right? and. Uh, I was kind of behind this, um, he's a night guard. So he was just sitting and just looking out into the like 
the distance, the horizon, this. For Emmanuel? No, no, no. So this is for um, oh, okay. one of the landscapes. Well, I'll talk about Emmanuel. Okay. And um, for that, um, what was really interesting with that picture was how overexposed a palm tree was in that picture. I couldn't show you. <laughs> but I'll show you. Show me, but I know. They all see. <laughs> What, what was really interesting was how an overexposed part of the image kind of like struck the audience, at least the, re the response I got from everyone was they were seeing so many different things. Mm -hmm. People were seeing bees, hornets, some people saw a lion. So for me, I've come to see that a lot of my work has those um, traits or those effects on people where you look at it, you kind of have to look at it a second time mm -hmm. because it says something to you every different time or mm -hmm. every other time you look at it. But yeah. And to the point about um, the portrait series, I'm um, working with Emmanuel and um, uh, a model that I worked with, um, his name we'll call him General. Um, what I sought to explore in that um, process was what does strength look like? Or how does, like, how, what are you able to take? Or how strong are you to deal with pain, for mm -hmm. example? So um, I had dumbbells. I thought it would be clever to have them lift. Mm -hmm. and then capture those as that essence of what pain leaving the body looks like or enduring pain kind of looks like. Mm -hmm. So that was what I was able to capture in that process for Emmanuel. So, so the image of the, the body and the muscles exactly. in, the, in, the, exactly. in the process of, yes. of lifting, but not the actual dumbbells themselves? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and um, the other bits where the, um, there's one that actually kind of ties in with Chotro that's behind this um, wall over here. A lot of um, themes that I see or things that I notice on my journey is <laughs> funny, I should use the word journey because it comes from um, riding with, um, like for the Chotro series, right? They usually come with inscriptions either on the back or in front. Mm -hmm. So it's like everywhere you look, there's some kind of a message, there's some kind of a reminder. And it's usually religious, right? Mostly religious. Or Christian. Often. Exactly. Uh -huh. So the one one behind us here is man, man will be God? Yes. Okay. It's like that stark reminder that you should never forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one image from that series was also um, a truck that was like parked, a lone truck parked with um, the inscription of God is watching. So for me, it was funny because it's like the headlights were looking at me and telling me something. So it's those um, moments or those philosophical um, moments that um, spring out, I guess, when I'm in the space, when I'm creating, or when I'm just randomly just being myself. Mm -hmm. So can we back up a bit? Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about what brought you here to Canada. What brought you, give us a bit about your journey to your artistic practice. All right. So, you know, all the pieces from education to yes. your initial explorations, etc. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start from film school mm -hmm. um, in that um, at that time, the National Film and Television Institute um, would admit a, an intimate number of students. So uh, like there were like 30 of us in that class. So never were there more than 120 students at once studying in the on campus so for me that experience was, was great because i got to intimately study with great minds such as myself in different um, aspects of it my major was in motion picture photography so that's actually where i guess before high school i took it upon myself to master the crafts of visual arts I love to paint, but I always thought it was somewhat messy. I hope I'm not getting any <laughs> flat. <laughs> I love to paint, but no, no shade on the paint exactly. I appreciate art. Yes. But for me to create it, I kind of always have to find something that works for me. Because one, um, I, I like to, I guess, without sounding lazy, right? I like to create things or create in a way that I find very, very easy to do because everything is in the moment for me. I need to capture it, right? It's great that if I'm able to sit down and then post-process work through it, but also mm -hmm. be able to create on the spot, that really is a thing for me. So that really advises a lot of how I practice my photography. Mm -hmm. Because of that, um, and I'll go on to some technical bits as well. Mm -hmm. In film school, I was lucky to be gifted a Practica MT-L3. Okay. So I had a 50mm on that as well as a one, two, three, five millimeter. So it was okay, is, is anybody catching any of this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So it's all so, very manual practice for okay. me. The great thing with that camera is like I had lots of moments with it because I learned about manual photography. Okay. And um, one neat thing that happened was um, I snuck away from school because Barack Obama and his family were in Cape Coast. Yes. So I had to be there for that weekend with my camera. Yeah. To go, Sad. To go to the door of no return. Exactly. exactly. Yep. So for that moment, it was really, really amazing for me. Unfortunately, I couldn't capture him because I was too far off and my lens wasn't adopted good enough for that. But I kind of got some FaceTime with Anderson Cooper, so I guess. <laughs> I, I, Second best. I, I will take it gladly. <laughs> after, after Michelle. Exactly. So for that process, that has been for me, the camera has always been a part of me in those moments that really matter. Mm -hmm. Whether it's just there because I need to hide behind it, or it's what there. What do you mean hide behind it? In the sense that um, I grew up a very shy person. I wouldn't be the one to initiate conversation and all of that, but the camera really kind of took all of that stress away from me and made it easy for me to interact with people. Mm -hmm. People love taking pictures. I, I, grew, I grew to understand that now and like looking back because Usually when I go out and like go for my walks, it's with my camera and people identify me because of the camera and mm -hmm. all of a sudden we are friends. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew it really played a key role in my growing, in growing as an artist. But going on to develop from school, right, I was lucky. I got pushed by a mining company that was just about setting up a digital media um, suite like um, wing of their communications department. Mm -hmm. So I was thrown right into corporate work. Like I knew literally nothing about communications, mm -hmm. but I, I like to think that I had a great team. Um, my um, our director was um, a woman who was very strong at what she did, who was very vocal in like uh, the work that she did and in teaching me what I needed to know mm -hmm. to add to what I already knew as an artist. Cause mm -hmm. That side of my brain was like really developed and always like, why can't we do this? Oh my God, you're missing that opportunity. It was always difficult for me to bring my voice across mm -hmm. because I wasn't good at telling or sharing how I needed to show what I needed to do with, like I'll give an example, right? So for example, if we would take images that we're going to share a memo with, right? Mm -hmm. I would always go for, oh, this is more artistic. Why don't we use it? Okay. But then she would understand or the team would understand that's not how it really works and you'd need to take care of certain things. This so is not I, a gallery. Exactly. <laughs> this is about so, corporate communication. Oh my so. God, it was a constant struggle. Mm -hmm. In a little bit of love, obviously, but it was a constant struggle. But what, what, what did that context and that work teach you? What did you take from that? That, that there are different ways of communicating one and that essentially it's about a message. Mm. So that I took straight from then. Yeah. I guess that my process there, that's what I got from it. I learned a lot about corporate culture, so much so, and the things that I'm seeing around me today, it all makes sense because of that um, bit of um, journey that I partook in. And um, for that, if I'm to talk about technical um, bits, the kind of equipment I was using now, I graduated from the MTL3, obviously. <laughs> so is that a manual camera? It's a very, very manual camera. Okay. Just before I finished film school, I got the Rebel T2i. Okay. It was exciting for me because that was around the time that DSLR filmmaking was like breaking out and it was easy for anyone, quote unquote, to actually make and produce mm -hmm. work. So for me, I, I love taking pictures, but it also offered me the um, opportunity to practice video as well. I mean, I was majoring in motion picture photography, so it, I might as well just do them. So, so, so what is motion picture photography? All right, so for me, it's the study of cinema okay. in the case of how do you capture images? Mm -hmm. So um, as a cinematographer, it's me determining what kind of light you would use mm -hmm. and how you'd set your angles, what lens elements will be, will you be using to help the director create the maze on scene that should be created. Okay. I had time and practice, lots and lots of practice, because again, I think I got lucky because um, I always found myself in a group that was very, very enabling, one being the creative society. So right from film school, as I was juggling corporate work, I was also doing creative work. I was in the music video making scene. Okay. I got to meet fantastic like stars at that time, work with them. It, it was amazing, my life. <laughs> <laughs> so like there was like something happening every other weekend 
like work week was good, boring, tedious. You had to do it. But on the weekend, oh my God, there was Bella Roma to go to because there was a party that I needed to go and That's Bella Roma. It's no longer there, but it was, it was one of those hot spots. The pizza was amazing. Was it Accra? Accra, yes. Yeah. I had my first Amalfi there by, um, her name is Tina. She's amazing. She's in Sweden now. But yeah, I, I, I digress. <laughs> we digress. <laughs> yeah, but you get the sense of how I grew with how I learned and practiced my um, techniques. Mm -hmm. Working for corporate means I was able to get high-end equipment as well. So I wasn't just using the T3, T2i right now. I was actually in the 5D Mark III section of... Okay. <laughs> Wait, 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 see, that was at question number seven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm knowing how you jump. Oh, right. Really, really, like, you know, I have to, I guess, go yeah. ahead. Keep going. Yeah, so tell me, when you grew up, let's at least describe what that, that um, All right. I will. piece of equipment is. Good. So the 5D Mark III then was ultimately like the high end HD video camera. Okay. It was, it, I think it came with a Logic um, 4, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, you can always Google. But yeah, it was then for me, like, oh my God, it's a 5D Mark III, right? Mm -hmm. when, you pre when you appear on the set, at least, for that kind of work too, it was mostly an unoff report photography. Right. So trips to the mine site, it was just amazing, I know. <laughs> Getting to ride on the whole truck, like interacting with people who were actually doing the work, uh -huh. that taught me a lot. So yeah, it was great. And the camera was great because, I mean, it makes the work easier so that you don't focus too much on that, am I getting this right and all of that and just focus on what you're doing. Okay, cool. Um, it's interesting to me that, that you do have a film background, right? And that, um, that video making was also a part of your practice before coming here. Um, because I think you had, there were hundreds, right? There, like, I'm looking at Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd see them as like frames, right? <laughs> so, you know, Kwesi had like hundreds of images. Um, so the show you see here is distilled from lots. So even within the Malcolm, there were like at least a hundred images. Different from dress changes as well. Yeah, so, yeah. different outfits from whatever. So, um, so as a curator, I think one of the things that 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 sort of guided my selection of the images, you know, was the sort of cinematic quality of them. Yeah. Um, that, you know, they seem like stills from a film, um, literally moments of motion captured, um, and very sort of narrative. Um, so repose, I mean, the piece I wrote about repose is that piece around, you know, seeing this beautiful black, black body on this hard gravel and then thinking about, you know, wh how did he get there? <laughs> What's going on in his head? When you look at Beach Boys, you know, you're seeing interactions, you're seeing relationships, you're seeing connections just in the gestures of the bodies of the boys. And, you know, you imagine the, the dialogue, right? You imagine you hear the sound of, of the sea, um, the ocean. <laughs> yep. Um, so, so your work has a very cinematic quality and um, the pieces that are here are ones that, that sort of felt to me very much like frames or stills yep. um, from... from film. Um, is there a question in there? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I could oh, so, so, I guess, so I guess the piece is, I guess that was my lead in to, to have you talk about, you know, some of the work in the work that's here. So some of the series of, of pieces that are, that are in this gallery around us. Yeah, I, I, I will. And um, first of all, I love cinema. That's one of the reasons why I actually searched and found the course or the school that would help me be in that space where I could develop that love. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I made it a point while I was in film school and I'm not going to talk too much, I will come back to it, to actually watch at least 50 of the top 100 AFI um, movies that I, we all have to AFI, see. American, American Film Institute, Institute. yes. Okay. Um, Citizen Kane, I remember going, <laughs> those, we had tapes back then. So. I mean tapes. <laughs> VHS. For, for the, for the <laughs> <laughs> VHS um, recording, so you slide it into a deck and actually press play and all that. <laughs> yeah, we've come, we've come a long way and I really appreciate it. Like, you don't remember this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for me, I decided to study from at least what is regarded as the best mm -hmm. to understand why they are mm -hmm. so-called and see how I can also recreate 
So for me, when I look, I'm kind of seeing the frame and what's happening in that frame and what could change and how I would arrange it if I had my way. So in my creative process, mm -hmm. I'd rely on that cinematic approach because in a way, everything around us is like everything you are looking at, you are capturing. Mm -hmm. You're capturing to remember, you're capturing to be in that moment, whatever it is that your personal experience would be, there's some cinema to it. So in that regard, right, I think I will kind of start with Boutry because that's the first one you see when you um, walk in. It sounds like boat, so it's kind of fits in with the title, but Boutry is actually a little coastal town in the western part of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And um, to get there, I took a bus, got off that bus, took another bus, got off that bus, took something like a taxi. I know it's a journey. <laughs> I took a taxi and finally had to walk across some kind of a bridge just to get to the cottage I would be staying. But in that moment, I did that travel. I like to travel solo sometimes. And in 2016, getting into 2017, my friend Eric was doing, a, um, I think he had gone back, he had done a project um, called the Gambaga Witches Project, right? Mm -hmm. So he was up there photographing women mm -hmm. living in their like space and getting to know them and understand the process to share with the world because it's really, import really important. And um, I stayed there with him um, in Gambaga and from there we tripped down and got back to Accra and I continued on to Cape Coast and then to Butre. So Butre for me was a part of that journey for me to study myself as a photographer because um, most of the work I've been doing was for corporate work. Butre, Gambaga, all of that was for me to take that moment for myself to so, go back into the process of photography. So, so right there, creative exploration. Exactly. Yeah. So Butre right there is one of the images that I got from that trip. I was, it was an amazing trip. I got to meet people. I got to get pictures of the fort, uh, is it Battenstein? I think it's one of the relics that remain stark reminders of the history that we all share. And um, what's that history? Well, I would say colonization is one. Mm -hmm. And there are points that are always there to remind us. And like, there's always some kind of reinforcement that um, a sense that you get when you see it, it's there, right? And it's hard to ignore and mm -hmm. we still live with it today. So, so there's, a, there's a physical presence. Absolutely. Yeah. And even to just oppose that against, you've seen um, the one with uh, Beach Boys uh, against the Cape Coast Castle. You can see the playfulness at the bottom, but behind it, that huge looming stark reminder again. So for me, and that's- Sorry, process, sorry, for folks who don't know, what's, what, what, is, what does the Cape Coast Castle remind one of historically? Historically, that was the point where um, slave trade was um, take slave trade took part in that location. There was one door that says door of no return, and obviously, we all know what that means at this point. But yeah, for me, I grew up there, right? It was a part of me. I mm -hmm. would see tourists come in and visit and see people who I really touched, and those like there's so many things, so many um, ways to look at it, right? But Ultimately, for me, it's where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And to capture that is me sharing a part of where I grew up and what it's like on mm -hmm. a normal Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. for example. So for that, that's what that means to me. There are two others that are actually from, they are still in the Beach Boys series, but they are from Jamestown in Accra. Mm -hmm. While I was working in corporate, I had um, the privilege of um, preparing a day tour for our group executive for comms. He was visiting for our annual retreat, those things, right? And um, for me, he decided he would have a day where, because he's also a photographer, so the two of us would just go on a photo walk and take pictures, and that was what came out of that as well. If I'm to move on to directly what's ahead when you um, enter So, so, So the Jamestown images are the ones of the boys in, in the, the water. water. Exactly, there's yeah. one, the boy almost going in yeah. that point. Is that the single image? The yes. Single one? yes. Was that almost drowning? No, no, he was just, his, the series would show him standing on this, I know, <laughs> the cinema of it all. Mind. <laughs> yeah, so he was actually standing on a little, like a stand of sorts, yeah. where they usually just play, yeah. get on there and yeah. jump. Yeah. So a few of those are up at band as well, but that's ultimately what it is again. Mm -hmm. A normal day, a normal afternoon in a crowd on the beaches, you're bound to encounter such experiences. Yeah. And I was going on to talk about the bit about umbilicus. 
for me. Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it. Should we come in here then? Let's go to Malcolm. All right. So Malcolm is the only series from Toronto. So Malcolm, the Malcolm is the alpha that has the warning about you know um, natural ruling your body. What's how to say? Uh, Not body, body in its natural it state. Natural, <laughs> yeah, so there's some nakedness and nudity. Yes. <laughs> yes. Go. So. <laughs> I was saying that um, for me, Malcolm, the Malcolm series or Malcolm for me is that individual, that amazing soul that I came to meet, one of the first people I met when I came into Toronto and I reached out to him on Twitter. I mean, usually that's how I, I'm always online. So when I see someone that I'm interested in getting to know about, I would reach out and say, hey, let's have a talk. So we met up at Dundas and had a talk. We began something of a relationship that would be a photographer versus, um, not versus, but a photographer and his muse. And that's what that is for me, right? I admire him so much because of the, what he represents. One thing that stands out from, for me with Malcolm is he preaches love, right? And that's something that I, I'm always, always looking for. Cause, not because there's not enough of it. I think there's enough all around. But anytime I see some like I guess somewhere that it's so blinding, I want to be there and understand why and capture it. Mm -hmm. So that's Malcolm for me. He just embodies love. You get to know him, he has so many books, so you will never get tired of talking about anything with him. But I'm hoping that the images do justice because he's really, really, he's an amazing soul. Yeah, and that's a really tightly edited Yeah. Because <laughs> there's so many images I know. of Malcolm. Yeah, and he's, in, he's in, sorry, in, go on. You know, just role play. Yes. Yeah. Um, with candles. Yes. In, in sort of like king, king gear. Yes. Um, so it's a very sexual yes. series. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. And and those those images are the only ones that are actually taken here in Canada. Yes. So and I think I should have mentioned right the idea behind Honam is body in Akan. It means body or skin. Mm -hmm. So it's just me being clever with um, Honam being the body of work that I am sharing with the Canadian audience. So yeah. now you know what Honam means. <laughs> you could use it, <laughs> feel free. But yeah, essentially that's it. Showing the body of work. Should we get over here? Well, let's, oh, let's, yes, do, let's do it the way. Um, so let's start go with um, Chocho. All right. So Chocho, I mentioned. Chocho, Chocho, I know. Chocho, <laughs> yep. Cho 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 is like a is like a minibus, right? It's a minibus that's a public transport uh, medium, relatively cheap. Gets you where you need to be quickly if there's no traffic. I mean, you always have to find some kind of entertainment because um, it's not always um, ideal. Because one. I've noticed, or at least some of the trips that I've been on, it's usually, it's either, it's either you're with your friends mm -hmm. or you are with, you're in a space with people you know nothing about. So anything could happen, mm -hmm. but that's what adds to the joy of it, right? Because both, all of you are in that space, commuting together. You are a community yeah. in that space until you get to where you need to get off and all of that. So that really stands out for me, aside the fact that they always come with inscriptions on them. So think about that kind of journey as well, right? So. Yeah, Trotro for me is that. It's that point of convergence where people come from all walks of life mm -hmm. for whatever reason, going wherever it is that they're going, yeah. that you all share in that space and that moment. Yeah. If there's something on the radio, you all listen to it together. Yeah. You all laugh if there's something funny. You yeah. all like, yeah, it's, 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 it's something. You need to experience it. And when we talk about the, dias the African diaspora, so folks who are here from the Caribbean or from parts of Africa, I think even if I'm even thinking of Brooklyn, <laughs> so neighborhoods in Brooklyn where there'd be the dollar taxi or whatever. This mm. was before, you know, that shared Uber, that people would be thrown together. Wow, I never and knew that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's their version of the Cho Cho everywhere. Exactly. Where, where, exactly. Where, where they're black folk. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So Cho Cho and Jaguar. Yes. So Jaguar is from the same day as um, the day I got repose. I spent an afternoon with my friend Frank, who unfortunately passed um, last November. But in that moment and in that space, it was him, Frank, um, our model, I'll call him Morpheus. And we just usually, we do photo walks or just invite a model to work with and practice, right? And that's how we're able to capture these moments. But specifically for Jaguar, right? Um, 
The funny story is the location that we chose to do that shoot, it was something of an abandoned um, auto mechanics shop. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing with that location was it was just filled and like filled with decaying um, luxury vehicles. Okay. So there was, I remark, I remember, I quite remember one that was actually like a white Chevy Corvette and several Jaguars. So it was interesting for me that in that space, the fleeting, the fleetness of it all, if I should use that word, mm -hmm. like it's all here, it's all temporary, but mm -hmm. sometime in the future, it will probably be dust. Yep. So that's Rust what, exactly, exactly. That's what, that's how it spoke to me. So yeah, those images from that series is about that. Back to Trocho, mm -hmm. the, the image of the, so the image is taken from the back of the, the Trocho with, with men. What, what's your relationship to the, the folks who were in the, in the vehicle? I shared their story. I shared that moment. We are all in the same, I guess, our lives are intertwined at that moment. Okay. That's how I would see it. Because um, in that moment, as you're moving together, mm -hmm. you all kind of have your lives in the hands of the driver, mm -hmm. in a way. And um, you, whatever it is that you're all, you, I'm enduring, everyone else in the bus is enduring as well. So until it's up to the point where I need to get off, I'm with them, I am them. So they're strangers. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about repose. Okay. There was a, we had a whole conversation about Morpheus. Yes. What was this? I don't remember this. So Morpheus, I think, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me. It's either a Greek god of dreams. Oh, yes. So okay. for this to look like that, right, it's like in a dream state. Yes. He's So the image of repose is a, is a far corner here with the beautiful young man on, on the gravel. And in the series, there were images of the model um, with his eyes open. And for whatever reason, I felt it was I important know. to just choose the images with his eyes closed. I think you should tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I talk about it in, in the, the bit in the bit in the front there, the um, the essay. It's that piece around interiority. So it's around you know it's around not having the subject of the image be engaging with you. They're not looking. Okay. They're actually. Thinking, whatever they're, they're thinking, they're dreaming, whatever is happening is happening within them, and it's not about necessarily engaging you or centering you as as a viewer. Whereas um, sometimes when images are looking straight at you, there's a there's that kind of dynamic. Yeah. So so all the images I, I selected were images of him with his eyes closed, and then we were talking, and you said that his name is Morpheus, and Morpheus means. Say again. The God of Dreams. The God of Dreams. Yes. Well, at least um, that's what I gathered from the Matrix series. If <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge Matrix. One of, the, one, of the, one of the 100? I am a huge <laughs> Matrix buff, so please. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, that was a moment for me. I was like, oh, there's, there's something going on here. Um, let's go to Gold Chain. Okay. Which image is a Gold Chain? I These remember. ones over here. Um, what that technically the equipment I used Nikon that was like the first time I had started using Nikon but I also realized it also has its um, great effects that it gives but for this particularly right it was um, uh, a work assignment trip to Takaradi I was doing some work for a hotel that I got to stay there and like just be there and photograph and it was fun, yes. I know. <laughs> and they just, he and his friends, they, I guess they had come from Accra or something. They had just pulled up. Mm -hmm. They were all out in the parking lot and just having a jolly good time. Okay. And I was like, oh, wow, what's happening here? Let me go find out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and one thing led to the other and yeah. Maybe he, one thing led to the other. Conversation. Okay. How are you doing? What's happening? And just being in the I'm moment so with them. The <laughs> 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 I know. So that's how it happened, right? Okay. So it was good. We became friends. We actually went on to actually do short video documentaries of what was happening there, but my card got corrupted somehow, so I lost that. That was terrible. But yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> For these images, right, I was working then. I had just gotten a Leica Deluxe 109. That's what I used for the video and some of the stills, and for Malcolm as well. But these images that you see before us um, were with the D700, which is a Nikon. 
it's great because one, it's full frame and I think we can tell by the depth of it all and some of the bouquet in there. And obviously how sharp the gold chain is because that's really like, I don't know if the paper added to it too because I was actually excited. I was telling um, is it, um, Kathy, one of the docents, about how the images were just so stuck and it just popped out and pro probably it's because it's the paper. I'm not used to seeing my work this printed on this kind of... Um, it's, 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 it's striking and particularly in contrast to, to the skin. Exactly. Of I mean, it could be an ad, it could be an advert. <laughs> Maybe I learned that from corporate. <laughs> but yeah, some of that it ties into the work I do. I try to strive for that perfection. Mm -hmm. So one dream of mine, right, is actually to have work on billboards that's ads, but they are actually not like photoshopped and they are real. Mm -hmm. So let's hope we see that day soon. Um, the images behind us, the, from the, this is the parade series. Yep. Right? This is special because one, I like to think I knew a lot about things that happened in Accra, but I had no idea that at the end of the holy month of Ramadan, there is always a carnival, a parade, of, um, to mark the end of the season among the um, Muslim community. And my friend, we'll call him King, because that's how we found each other. Mm -hmm. And um, he invited me to... He didn't tell me what was happening. <laughs> he just said, bring your camera. And this, I got to understand, this was the reason why, because it was just an amazing show. People came dressed in regalia, right, to just celebrate. And for me, that was a beautiful moment that I was very, very privileged to have been a part of. And that's what it is. The reason why it's all blurry and full of fluidity is I intentionally try to play with a slow shutter speed. Mm -hmm. So I would kind of still maintain some motion in the um, works, but still have some, even the sharp um, subjects in there are not really sharp because it's a really slow shutter speed and I didn't carry mm -hmm. a, um, a tripod. That would have been in the way. Yeah. If everyone would know you are there taking pictures and that becomes a different That's story. Actually, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. I don't want to interfere with what's happening. Mm -hmm. I really like to be the one who quickly got that image and was able to just be a part of it all as it happened. So that's what this is for me. I, I said to somebody earlier that, you know, sometimes I, I misremember or I, I imagine things that didn't happen or were said. <laughs> just so you know. Um, that, you know, you only had one request when I was curating, was that, that I have that image in the show. Did I make that up? That I'm way. not sure. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> okay, I think I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but then again, it's been a long process, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. We, we select it. We, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one of the things I love about this series was, was the capturing of the motion. Um, and, and in the capturing the motion that, that pieces or parts of the animal would be, would be invisible yes. or would be transparent. And it was a similar thing when we look at the um, um, Malcolm, Malcolm series, series yeah. is Malcolm is captured in, in motion. And, and in the motion, in the sort of the way that you photographed him, um, you know, parts of his body became transparent. You know, there are things that were sort of shapes. That's, I like to think of that as the essence, right? Mm -hmm. So again, being this, the cinema background that I have, if I'm able to show, it's like I'm cheating because this is a 2D um, surface and if I'm able to give some depth to it, mm -hmm. it's, I've done my work. You have indeed <laughs> done your work. Um, and the final series, and the series behind us in the corner here, yep. which is among my favorite. I know. And my that portrait of Kofi on the, on the single image on the wall is you know, is the image I want, I want for my home. <laughs> <laughs> so talk, us, talk about this series. And then this is series, one of the things about this series is this series is, is studio work. Yep. So for the Emmanuel series, I did the three point lighting. I had a whole strobe set and everything. Mm -hmm. But for this, I had just one um, lamp. I, I was, that was me being minimalistic using what I have to create what I want. So if it's not daylight, it's some kind of artificial lighting that's available. So if you'll see, right, that slit is actually the light's hood and behind is Kofi. And this, or behind you, would be the actual image without showing what 
was part of the process of making the image. So that's like the final product, but these are just a playfulness of the creative process. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's called the, and, and the light, the light, or the, yes. what's it called, the lamp? Yes. It becomes, becomes like a sort of a graphic. Exactly. Yeah, and an object yep. behind which, you know, he can hide, he can engage or interact, you know, that sort of, um, that illuminates, but also obscures. Exactly. Um, and it's beautiful and very graphic. Love this, I love this corner. Yep. So it's one light source. I, I, I know it's sometimes you have to play break rules. Yeah. And sometimes the effects are really, really um nice. Yes. Um so what we did here was a bit of a mix. Because I had this question that was um that I had written. And I'm gonna read it just because you know. Um, I, like many folks, have a tendency to approach artworks, particularly works of black artists, from the perspective of what my, uh, my friend and mentor, um, the UK-based um, photographer Ajamu, often calls sociology. Um, the lens of identity, representation, narrative themes, and social contexts, um, all legitimate and relevant concerns, but often at the expense of the exploration of process. Um, the making, the technical and technological elements in creating the work, and photography is a particularly technical medium. Um, so I just want to, even though, you know, we weaved, <laughs> you got it in there, <laughs> you jumped, actually jumped ahead. <laughs> in terms of weaving the technical and the process pieces in this dialogue, um, in ways that we often don't have when we're looking at work of black artists, that we're really focused on thematics, and we're focused on narrative, and we're focused on um, the sort of sociological context of the artist or the, 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 the images. Um, so I really appreciate that you were in there and you can do the end, 49, and you know, all those sort of important technical pieces. <laughs> I held off on um, Umbilicus. So Umbilicus is, is the biggest image in the show. Um, it greets you as you walk into the gallery space. And the, the question for me around Umbilicus is kind of obvious. It's, it's striking not just for, you know, the, the, the size of your production and the texture that you capture in the skin of the subject and, um, and somebody had described in the opening as like the perfect belly button. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for those who, who know a bit of, about film history and, and, and uh, photography, mm -hmm. um, you know, some folks would think of um, the work of Robert, Robert Maplethorpe. Um, and he did a, a piece called Belly Button. And so that got me thinking about influences. Do you know that image? I know of Robert Mapletop, and obviously he played a huge role in my um, photographic process in that um, I found out once um, a while back that he passed a few, um, like a month or so after I was born. Okay. So a point in my life in probably high school or in the university, right, um, while gathering and as massing as much knowledge as I could. Mm -hmm. He came into my, um, my view mm -hmm. and a lot of his work I found very, very striking and very, very, um, I would say interesting in the sense that um, I wasn't used to seeing images like that. So right there and they had left a mark that I sought to express as well okay. in that, um, yeah. So belly button, I would have to see it. But oh, yeah. I believe it's... Google it. I will. <laughs> I will. And so for people who don't know, Robert Maplethorpe is, was um, a really significant um, American queer um, photographer. And he focused a lot on, on bodies. And he is famous as, as a white photographer for focusing on black male subjects. Um, he actually had a, a body of work and a, and a book that was published, I think, on the black work. Um, and it's very kind of contested work because it brings up this piece around power dynamics between the white photographer and the black subject, the relationship and, and, and agency are things that come up with the work of Robert Maplethorpe. Um, but I just thought it was interesting that- To see it here, it's yeah. like the other way around. But yeah, so when, when, you, when Kofi talks about the work, that's the work that you're talking about. So it's you, maybe some of the images from the black book Yes, um, there is an influence there, definitely. Okay. And what are some of your other influences? I mean, in, in terms of this body of work, but just generally, generally in terms of your practice? Yep. Call some names. Absolutely. 
the name I would be able to instantly call right now is um, James Barnard. Okay, James Barnard. Yes. Tell us about James Barnard. For James, um, I call him Uncle James when we chat on Facebook. Because oh, even James are in a... <laughs> you know, His work of sharing with me and with the world, the generations that were before me, that really left a mark in that his work is like really outstanding and what they mean to um, the future generations who, are, who will get to experience his work and that indelible mark that he's left or he's leaving, mm -hmm. that for me really stands out. As a photographer, not to, sorry, as a photographer, right, if you're able to do your work diligently, like keep doing it every time, like if it's for me, right, it's, it's not only like a calling, right, it's something that I have to do. Right. So to see that he's done it and done it so well, it makes it possible and make me know that, yes, I can also probably get to that stage. So that's a huge inspiration for me. So just hang on a sec. So um, Bam, a number of years ago, did, a, did a, a James Barner show. And so James Barner is um, a Ghanaian photographer. Um, how old is he now? He'll be 93 next month. OK. Um, and he, uh, you talk about doc documented generations, so documenting images of Ghana from the, what, the, probably the 50s? Yes. And then he also... Through to the UK. And then he traveled to the UK? Yes. So, in a way, our lives are kind of similar. So, yeah. that inspiration, I mean, I can't really go without mentioning. So, yeah, he's a huge inspiration for me. Has, have you shared your work with him? I usually what I'll share is over the phone, mm -hmm. right? But yeah, that's the kind of conversations we have. But I have, I'm looking for the day where I get to actually meet him and have that conversation. So it's, we'll see. Um, uh, and any other influences? Any other names you want to call? I can, and this is purely because of her style of work, right? Rinko um, Kawuchi, I think. Okay. She's a Japanese um, photographer. And what I love about her work is how mundane they would look, but there's always some poetic depth to it. Mm -hmm. I always look out for that in my work, and I hope I'm able to present some of it when I do. But for her kind of work and what she's doing and how she presents it, it's so clean, it's so minimalistic, it's just brilliant. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, my friends Eric and Kwesi Taku, of course, that um, what I like about them and their work is Where how- they based? Sorry, they are based in Accra, in yeah. Ghana at the moment. How I appreciate their work is how they're always challenging themselves to present new work. And they are always doing amazing work at it. So for me, it's always looking and seeing that, yes, they are doing great work and I could also do same or like learn from them. And just recently I came across um, Angelica Das's work mm -hmm. and um, re with regards to her human AI project, where in, I will give a little brief of how I, I, I understand it to be and her process. But what she does is she photographs her subjects. She invites people and like travels around the world and photographs people and shares as a background their pigment, their skin tone as it is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm going to delve into color later on in my practice, but I needed to arrive at a point where I could present people as they are. And I believe Angelica has done a great work at that. So if your image is shown, you would see your Pantone skin code. Oh my God, it was like, it's just brilliant. So for me and the issue or the subject of people of color, mm -hmm. I think she's done amazing well and I would really, really love to follow her footsteps. Brilliant. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up. Oh, already? And then if folks were here, <laughs> if they have questions, some opportunities to ask you some questions. Um, so one of the co-presenters of this exhibition is, is a project that I founded called Legacies in Motion, um, Black Queer Archival Projects. And it would be remiss of me to, to not ask a question around queerness. So talk to us, Crazy, about how queerness informs your work or this body of work or your practice. Well, I believe that it's um, a part of a spectrum that um, yes, in capturing my, like creating my work, right? I try to have as much of a space to have everyone as possible. Mm -hmm. So yes, obviously there are spaces in which I'm interacting with the queerness of it all and mm -hmm. bringing it out as um, a part of the body of work that I present. Mm -hmm. So in What's a way, like, it would look like, um, 
One, obviously, gorgeous male bodies. That's one. Okay. It would also be just being who you are without having to tell me anything about yourself. Because <laughs> usually, it's not for me to either know or even inquire. Okay. Growing up, I, it's um, a part of me that I, I guess I haven't developed very much. I don't really... It's not like I don't care about you or care about people. I only let you share what you can or want to share. Mm -hmm. So uh, to that effect, I never really... I guess, yeah, it's there, but <laughs> it's there. Yeah, it's there. Um, and my final question would be, you know, I mean, this is in, in, in essence a retrospective. Um, you know, many of the pieces here, they range from the earliest was 2014 up to what, 2019? 19, yes. Some of the series. Um, so, you know, I'm interested in, in how do you see, where do you see your practice going? What are you currently working on, envisioning, any projects upcoming? Okay. That's, that's that question. So with, I guess for the last couple of years, once um, the pandemic hit, a lot of the work that I will probably be doing as a photographer was also halted. Mm -hmm. So I went into lending my agency and all the expertise that I learned across the ages to a younger group of um, folk that I'm working with currently. And, specifically in the areas of music and talent management. Mm -hmm. So on that front, I'm hoping to develop it somehow and somehow, I guess, eventually express myself in the musical sense. I love dance music. Like actually I did an analytics thing on myself to see what kind of music I listen to and that's what it appears to be. <laughs> so I will probably be working in the spaces of creating music. Okay. And, um, Definitely what I'm looking forward to, and I've actually started the process of it, is to go into academia. Mm -hmm. I'd really love to study um, AI mm -hmm. and how I can merge my art with it. So philosophy is another area that I'm really, really keen on. So doing that work or that practice around philosophy, mm -hmm. that would be where I'll be going. So essentially music and academia. But photography obviously is already cemented, as we can all see. And um, yeah where I'm able to lend my voice, lend my work to whatever of course that needs to have my presence, that's where I'll be. So there's a commitment to also engaging in community. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you all for your presentation. Um, and just take a few minutes, if, if there's anybody here who'd like to, to ask a question, just stand up and Open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> or you can make a comment. Yeah, yeah. All right, Mr. Gray. Yes, I, I, I've used this in so many spaces, taking pictures, but I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you in Lincoln Park, I saw your patches and black events. Um, Passan, even. I did some yes, great portrait show work. We've, we've talked, but you, you said something around. I think at some point there was a, your connection with your spirituality. Has that changed prior to recognizing that? Did your work change after that? Was there a change in how you see things after that in your art? I think the really simple answer to that would be there's always something I learn that I either add to because I find it very valuable or discard because it has no space in my life or in my mental health. So to that effect, my spirituality, I got it really, really well. I like to think I do by either filling my space with things, people, experiences that add to that growth. Cause that's one area that I'm really, really keen on is growing and growing in a way that I'm making a positive impact, not only for myself, but for the people that come my way, because I feel like it's an obligation I have, I self-imposed, but yeah, absolutely. And my second point is um, the light. The, 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 the statement was profound. Um, it is said that wherever you are, whatever you need is right there. Mm -hmm. So when you spoke about, yeah, that for me was just brilliant. And, and I, I totally agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments? Uh, so, great work, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, this is 
kind of a little bit on what uh, Trevor just asked around identity. So as sort of being in a Canadian context um, for, you know, you said four years, so less than five years, has your identity shifted from the identity that you occupied or had or when you were in Ghana to being here in Canada? It has. In the ways that one, I've, I, and I've done some little research to that fact that um, I am part of what is maybe um, a percentage of a population that is visible, uh, a visible minority. That is a huge difference from where I'm from and what it means and how I'm um, having to, I won't use the word cope, but grow in that. It's been somewhat incredible, right, that every other day, I'm not the only one who is here who looks just like me. In that sense, it's been profound. And um, it's taught me one, because nothing really, I don't think anything really prepares you for a multicultural, um, I guess, situation, right? I like to think I worked in Accra, it's somewhat cosmopolitan, yes, but to this level, there's nothing that prepared me for it. So I'm taking every day as it comes, growing with the different communities that I come into contact with, learn from them, give off myself where I can, because I believe that's how we all grow, right? It's you give and you take. So for me, I guess that has been the experience, and I hope I answered the question. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking over this section. No pressure. <laughs> Jalen. Okay, so as I was listening to this, and yes, fantastic work, absolutely. Um, and seeing it a second time is also um, very revealing listening to um, the talk. Um, I started thinking about African history, I started thinking about slavery, colonialism. You talked about, um, you know, there, there's photographs of some of the artifacts, the infrastructure of slavery. Extraction. You talked about working for a mining company. The religion um, is also uh, those are artifacts of slavery. Um, their means of control. Um, you know the, the first wave here with Medus with Islam. Uh, there was never a, uh, a certain wave of conquest, and then obviously Christianity, another wave of conquest. Um, the message around man will be God. So um, we are not gods. Um, you know coming from other people set themselves up as gods and, um, and, and set their gods over us. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the whole piece about God is always watching and that, that surveillance and control piece, um, listening to that. Um, but then also, there are gods here. Morpheus is a god. Uh, Kofi, um, as, as, as in, 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 in beauty and, and the revelation that's occurring here, very, very godlike. And, um, and also the, the whole piece around uh, gold, the gold chain. Um, the reason uh, we are here is because of gold. Uh, it started with gold, it started with Portuguese and the Gold Coast, mm -hmm. um, trying to break the, the monopoly that the Arabs had um, and, um, and, and, and get to Asian riches. And so you, like all of these pieces are telling me a very distinct story about history, about struggle, about control, and ultimately that our bodies are representative of godliness. And, um, and so it, 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 it's almost a negation of what we've been told and, um, and just the irrepressibility of who we are. And so I just want to say, yeah, I don't have questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's Thank a, you. Yes, all of that, David. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's Thank you. And the reason we, we as, as, as black people, we as, as people of African descent, we as, as folks whose ancestors were taken from the continent and dispersed around, around the world. Um, so when you said that pronoun, that was, that was the reason. Yeah. So Thank you for seeing it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Deep. <laughs> Um, and there are no other questions. Uh, going once, going twice. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much, Quasi.
<laughs> you made it. On, on, on the on equipment the here. Yeah, thank you, From um, TOTO Live. Yes. yes, thank you everyone for making the track. The conversation continues. Continue.